Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is a part of our China lecture series. My name is Jie Deling Bei and I am a junior research fellow here at ISDP's China Center and I will moderate this webinar. Today's webinar will address the rise of the Chinese party state and its global implications. We are very delighted and happy to welcome Dr. Bölje Jungian as the speaker for this webinar. Dr. Jungian has served as Swedish ambassador to China and Vietnam. He has been head of the Asia Department of the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs and department head at the Swedish International Development Agency. Currently, Dr. Jungian is an associate of the Asia Center at Harvard University, a senior associate fellow of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and a board member of the Stockholm China Economic Research Institute of the Stockholm School of Economics. We will start today's webinar with a presentation by Dr. Jungian and then we will move on to a Q&A session with the audience. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, please ask them in the Q&A function here below. And uh, Tobia and Ludian will also be present in the discussion. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to you, Dr. Jungian. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Great pleasure and uh, interesting times, no doubt. I hope that you can both hear and see me now. So I will be using uh, quite a lot of PowerPoints. Uh, and does the subject suggest I will be talking about China's rise? I think that is the biggest uh, challenge of our time. And uh, we, of course, the climate change is of a different order. Uh, I will also discuss the nature of the Chinese uh, party state, as I call it, uh, and I will discuss it in the context of the ongoing uh, global power shift. Some people are even talking now about a new Cold War. Is that so? That is a question that I will uh, touch upon briefly. Uh, I will not uh, discuss the, the corona, even in itself, the pandemic, but just note that it has, of course, profound uh, consequences on the world and certainly also uh, geo-economically, uh, strengthening China's role, actually. Last year, the Chinese only economy was the only major economy in the world that grew. And this year, according to IMF, it will grow by 8%, in fact. Um, the fact, I think, is that uh, this development has deepened uh, the tension between the US and, and China. Deepened tension, deepened distrust. It, and it also is a deepened uh, Chinese uh, nationalism, you may even say Chinese uh, chauvinism. And of course, a question is a uh, fundamental one for us all. How will US-China relations uh, develop? Will they be able to cope? Because this is really a, a huge, uh, uh, what, you, what we're witnessing is a very a major change globally. <clears throat> uh, can they manage this relationship? Uh, we know that it's not transitional this uh, rise of China or the complications, the distrust. And the uh, meeting that you <clears throat> read about two weeks ago that took place in Alaska confirmed that also the new uh, Biden administration is, is having a much tougher line than, than used to be the case. That has been confirmed, you may say. So and also you may ask what is happening to the uh, uh, post Second World War world order, multilateralism, the role of WTO, which has played such a major role in, in, in promoting uh, development in the world. <clears throat> the fact is that the China today, if you look at the most recent uh, uh, US assessment of its global security situation, that China is now the dominant dominate theme, is also now justifying further uh, American defense expenditure. Uh, Blinken, the new Secretary of State, uh, uh, he uh, spoke recently at the NATO meeting and uh, he spoke of China and Russia as major military threats, lumping together the two. In uh, November 2017, when, when uh, Trump was rather new as president, he, uh, he visited Beijing and uh, he spoke about his friend Xi Jinping, and he said that together they would uh, maintain a strategic leading role of head of state diplomacy uh, in developing bilateral relations. That was a very huge statement, and as we know, it was hardly possible, but just a, 
an expression of uh, Trump's ego, you may say. Mm. Today, according to most uh, assessment, uh, US-Chinese relations are the worst since normalization in 1979. At that time, they found each other in, in their mutual concern about the Soviet Union. You remember uh, Nixon's visit to China in 1972. <clears throat> As I said, I think that relations are the, probably the worst uh, since normalization 79. <clears throat> and it's quite fascinating to, to look back. This is a very telling picture. This is, as you know, the two vice presidents, Xi Jinping and Biden, meeting in 2012 uh, in California. Uh, and they very much stress thought that they're going to foster friendship. And there's a very optimistic tone. Uh, that is, that is completely gone today. Yeah, I even noticed that uh, Biden uh, recently called uh, President Xi Jinping a thug. Uh, and I, I just referred to the Alaska meeting that also uh, confirmed that, there is, that this is no, not the, a, a return to, the, uh, to, to uh, the Obama era, but a completely new face. Mm. If you look further back, <clears throat> Uh, this is a very telling moment. This is in the year 2000. And uh, the US and China had just agreed on, on uh, China's entry into WTO. It's a very major development. And uh, Clinton in his last year, he's very proud of this development. And he's saying that this will not only uh, promote uh, development in China and, and, and globally, but also promote economic freedom in China and beyond that, f demand for freedom. And he's, he's also referring to the World Wide Web just becoming of importance. And he's saying that for China to stop this development would be like trying to nail a pudding on a wall. He said, good luck. He's quite confident. China will be transformed. Uh, inter, inter, international norms will be increasingly respected. Uh, human rights as well. You may say that uh, the U.S. has a rather uh, hubris-like attitude. One has won the Cold War, uh, and as Fukuyama said after that, this was the end of history. Now there was only one system prevailing. It was a, a liberal democracy and market economy, and the U.S. was the hegemon. But you also know what happened since, that uh, the U.S. got stuck in the war in the Middle East, uh, now, after 20 years of war in Afghanistan, negotiating with the Taliban, that the invasion of Iraq was very consequential. Uh, we saw IS emerge and so forth. Then we had the financial crisis of 2008. <clears throat> so it was very heavy inheritance uh, for, for Obama to take over. He launched the idea of a pivot towards Asia. The US would shift towards Asia. And he was very successful in ultimately negotiating what they call the TPP, a Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership Trade Agreement, including everyone except China. But as you know, uh, it was uh, rejected by, by, by Trump. A very optimistic moment uh, was this moment in 2015. Obama and Xi Jinping, they are together, you may say, delivering the, the climate change agreement, the Paris agreement, a very significant, uh, I think, process that resulted in that, that showed that you could, even though tension were growing, you could still cooperate. Uh, but you also know that uh, Trump withdrew from this agreement. And that, that was, of course, a very consequential decision. Hopefully, the meeting in November this year in Glasgow will reconfirm a commitment by all major powers and actors uh, to, to the, the importance of climate change. But what we are seeing today is clearly a we are into an era not of convergence but of divergence and deepening divergence. For a long time, like Clinton has said, that there will be increased uh, con uh, convergence and that China will become just like us. That was the ultimate idea. Instead, now we are seeing divergence, we are seeing deeper polarization, uh, distrust, and uh, during the, the uh, uh, Trump years, a very unstable, a messy situation, let's say, unpredictable. Now we are seeing a, 
with the new administration, a more predictable situation, they de defining what was adversarial, what is competition, and what is cooperation, but still deeply comp complex. And of course, a fundamental fact is that the Chinese economy has been developing so rapidly. Especially important is the development since 2008. After the emergence of the financial crisis, 2008, China's economy continued to grow by almost 10%, by 10% a year. So in, if we take 2008-9, China was responsible for 30% of global growth, a very major development. And as you know, uh, China is, since long actually, the largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. That is uh, when you recalculate depending on purchasing power. Uh, and maybe in 2030 or so, even be bigger than the US also in nominal term. But still, of course, less than one third uh, per capita. But these are consequences, uh, which, are, which are also geopolitical. And you, but we say in a sense that 2008 was the beginning of something new, a new confidence in, in Beijing, a, a new, a, no, less of respect for the world, less respect for the, what you call the, the Washington consensus and all the advice that China had been given during the years. And of course, such a, a, a rapid development year after year after year uh, also has consequences which are going much beyond uh, economics. They are, they are deep and they are not uh, temporary. <clears throat> uh, how is it then possible? If you, I'm here posting a, the, the front page of a book uh, by Asher Mogul and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, published in 2012. A very, a book that's been discussed a lot in, in high, held in very high regard. What are they saying? They are saying that it's impossible to develop in the long run if you don't have the proper institutions, the, the, the legal system, ownership, and ultimately democracy. Then you are then there are too much of distortions in the economy, and uh, you are you are bound to fail. But as you know, China has, you may say, failed to fail. China has continued to grow. Uh, ever since uh, the reform and opening in 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 1978, and that brings me to another book of great importance, *The Light That Failed*, published just a few years ago, Kristev and Holmes, uh, because they are saying that what China did, China uh, adopted uh, its version of the market economy system and entered the global economy in a big way and uh, profited enormously from, from globalization, the, the era of super hyper globalization, but it remained authoritarian. And they even think that it was naive to expect China to become anything different uh, given its history and so forth. <clears throat> so on the basis of the liberal order, China emerged. China is often is described as being a lonely power, no real alliances, different arrangements certainly with countries, uh, but an, an, an a formal alliance with North Korea and very close like, to Pakistan and other countries and many partnerships, but uh, very different from, from the US with its large number of alliances, NATO and beyond, some 60 plus in all, mismanaged by, by, by uh, Trump. <clears throat> so you might say, is, is then China a uh, a, lo a lonely power. That is hardly the case. As you know, uh, today China is having an enormous footprint, global footprint, and that footprint is growing by the day, you may say. China is today the largest trading partner of some 130 countries in the world, and also a large investor, originally only a recipient of foreign investment, originally by Hong Kong and so forth, and more and more advanced, but now also together with Japan, the second largest for investec after the US and also providing uh, the loans and so forth exporting arms and de having developed cyber cyber technology which is also under export this is a picture of the, the belt and road initiative the, the new uh, silk road you may say and uh, as you know 
uh, it now covers 100 countries or so, uh, to a larger or lesser extent, uh, but providing infrastructure, not just uh, coal po fired power stations. And, and some countries are getting very indebted as a consequence, like uh, Sri Lanka is a famous example. So this role, however you look, it's, it's, it's growing. But also it's important to br mention briefly because we talk often about power and economic growth and GDP and so forth, but also 850 million people in China have been lifted up above the poverty line. So there are much wider income gaps than before. And there is a lot of wealth, a lot of billionaires today. In, 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 if you look at the, the new, latest Forbes listing, there are so many Chinese there, but also a uh, major effect on, 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 uh, on well-being uh, with wide disparities. What is true is it's an extremely, exceptionally investment-driven model. Uh, and uh, at, at times 45%, almost half of GDP has been invested, which is be much beyond what is uh, uh, normally. Uh, and of course, this has also has consequences when, when it comes to the climate. Uh, China is a rather late emitter, but today responsible for 27% or so of CO2, CO2 emissions this very year. So without China, no solution to the question of, of climate change. China is also by far the biggest producer of solar cells and, and will soon, I'm sure, will be also be leading when it comes to electric cars. Uh, so it's a complex picture again, but uh, coal power uh, uh, power stations are being built still today, a huge number, uh, and um, almost 50% of all the coal consumption in the world happens in, in China. This is a well-known picture in a way. What is less well-known maybe is how China has developed when it comes to R&D, research and development. You may even talk about a global shift also in knowledge production, not only a power shift. Uh, one example, uh, you take the best universities in, in, uh, in Beijing, Qinghua and Be uh, Beida. They are ranked as number 23 and 24 by the Times Higher Education Supplement for, for 2020, which is the most highly regarded ranking that we have. Uppsala is 102, as an example. <clears throat> and I have enormous investments in R&D. And you can also see similar development when it comes to uh, uh, other measurements like you reviewed uh, peer review papers and international patents. China, China is not leading qualitative in patents, but when it comes to new patents, it, it's, uh, it's uh, up, uh, up front. <clears throat> so you may even talk about a, a technological leap. And I think, and, and now we often talk about techno authoritarianism, a term that you, you see can, can emerge quite often. Um, and of course, this is very central when it comes to the trade war between the US and China. It's not just about goods, shifting goods and cheap stuff leaving China, but the, the core here is technology. Because China is so today so much more than the factory floor that we, it was in the beginning, providing uh, clothing and shoes and, and, and gadgets and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a truly different kind of economy in that sense. And of course, the trade war is about, hence, about so much more than soya, soya beans. And I think that technology will be at the very center and uh, international property rights and so forth, where China has a lot to deliver. And we also, there was also a story about cyber theft, which has to be looked into. But it also would be a mistake to say that China has, has succeeded just because uh, uh, this cyber theft is much more complex than that. <clears throat> And one image is, um, this is a nice image, but uh, uh, what is called Made in China 2025, launched in 2014, uh, identifying 10 key areas, right? Robotics in this picture, driverless cars and uh, so forth. And beyond that, artificial intelligence, where China already, I think, is, is leading because of the quantity of data matters very much. And of course, the most common symbol in everyday discussion is Huawei, 5G. This is okay in a sense the epicenter right now. Uh, but when I worked in in uh, Beijing, uh, once looked upon uh, Huawei as a rather recent company, a bit of a copycat. You can, today you cannot reduce uh, Huawei to a copycat. Its R and D budget is three times the 
the budget of Ericsson. So again, there is a risk for for a sort of, of war, not an old time war, but where technology at the very frontier. And uh, the clear consequence already, of course, is decoupling. That we can see that certain countries are not going to buy 5G, like also Sweden now and others, uh, while uh, so we, well, China has so many other markets, not, not less the emerging markets. So we have an, a situation here when it comes to security, which is worrisome. A couple of years ago, I, I attended a uh, academic conference in, in uh, Chengdu, in the Sichuan province. When I was there the first time, 20, 2005, there were 4 million people. Now there were 17 million people. Uh, what was striking here that on the floor that we had our meeting, there was one, you can, if you go to turn left, it's a party committee office. If you turn right, it's the chancellor's office. My point is that these are there, and I, I can assure that the party secretary is the more important person. And that is, has become increasingly so over the years. Uh, China is a party state, I'll come back to that now, that question now. Uh, and more so today than yesterday. Uh, China has been transformed into a deeper party state over the years. And the logic of the party state is that the party ultimately controls, commands and controls, integrates the government and all other political organizations, institutions, including the armed forces. Society is diverse, as you know, when you, you see image from China, uh, there are many other organizations, there are protests, but it's all controlled ultimately by the party. The system is what you call mono-organizational. And uh, the concept of the party state reflects its Leninist origin. The constitution explicitly mandates the leading role of the Communist Party, with Marxist Leninist as the ideological basis. Ultimate sovereignty lies with the party itself. But the, but the country is not communist in the original sense of collective ownership and so forth. It's, it's uh, capitalism in, in, the, in so many ways. Uh, and it, but it's, at, at its core, it's, 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 it's controlled by the party, the party Leninist. And it's, a, it's a, not just a variation of a, a, an authoritarian system. It's a, a, it's a unique uh, novel system, Hannah Arendt, describe that uh, as a novel form of government that differs essentially from other forms of political system in its, in its explicit ambition to control all political activity ultimately. And this is, so the essence is, is Leninist. And you have to understand it in the, in the history of also of, uh, of China's, China's recent history ever since the Opium War and what you, what the, the the disgrace that China experienced for so long and that led to ideas about uh, exploitation, imperialism and so forth. The concept of the uh, party state is used quite often, but it lacks a clear definition. Today, you often say that there are only five states left, China, Vietnam, Laos, North Korea and, and Cuba, and they are different in many ways. They have survived uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and so forth. Um, they've uh, and they have all developed uh, except North Korea as a very unique, unique case. Uh, what I have tried to do is in, in the coming book also on, on, on Vietnam actually, where I discussed the uh, Vietnamese and, and Chinese party systems, uh, I have I have tried to um, wait a minute, one second here now. No, I try to. Uh, make myself sort of definition of what, what I mean by a, a party state. Uh, briefly, there are six elements, mutually supportive pillars, as I say. Political power rests with the party. The party controls the army, armed forces, and the police through party leadership and high degree of party membership. The party controls the legislature and the administrative state. The party controls the judiciary, and the domestic security apparatus. The party ensures that civil society is kept within the constraints of the party state. The party exercises ultimate control over media and the interpretation of history. 
So it does, it's not just a one party state, it's, uh, it's something more, much more comprehensive uh, of a contract. And obviously, the Chinese party state meets all these six uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, more so, I would say, many people thought, as I said in Richard, Levy, over time, uh, China will go in a more uh, more, more sort of liberal reformist, also reform the political system. And instead, you have seen under Xi Jinping that the party state has, has grown deeper, has grown more comprehensive. At the latest party congress, which took place in 2017, it was said that the party should maintain absolute leadership of the People's Liberation Army and the armed forces. And, and also it was referred to Xi Jinping's thinking as a military leader. This is written into the party constitution. This was Xi's thoughts on, on socialism. Uh, so he was elevated in, in a way that, that uh, 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 only uh, Mao and, uh, and Deng Xiaoping has been, and he was elevated like that when still in office. I think it's quite clear that uh, Xi Jinping is uh, China's, China's strongest, most powerful leader uh, since Mao. And there is a cult surrounding him. And he has built a, a power base, concentration of power around him. There is no collective leadership that there used to be under Deng Xiaoping and onwards. And he has focused very much on anti-corruption as, as a means and a tool. <clears throat> and he's very, you might say, obsessed by the idea yeah, of stability. Stability. <clears throat> Still, uh, it's interesting. He he spoke in uh, after just after having become part secretary in 2012. He spoke in Guangdong, and um, he he uh, said, "How could the Soviet Union collapse? How is it possible? How could a party having control of even the armed forces? How could they let it happen? This must never happen." He said, "Never happen." But also, he has this nagging feeling, what one American scholar calls the 70 year itch. It's itching, the fact that the Soviet Union could collapse. Could it happen also in China? But of course, so many things are very different. But stability is really an obsession. Democracy has, of course, never been on the agenda of the People's Republic of China. But even less so. In 2013, um, uh, the party adopted what they called a, a document on, on the seven evils. And the number one evil was constitutional democracy. It was the, uh, the, the bluff that the Western world was promoting in order to, to undermine China and developing countries. Over time, Xi Jinping has been developing his ideas of China's role as a China should contribute in a big way to, to the to development of humanity uh, and other such large ideas China should play uh, enter the world stage and play a major role on the world stage and so forth uh, and give its contribution to mankind. That kind of talk is now prevalent. Another dimension more eternally is loyalty, loyalty to, to the system. And also, you cannot question Mao Zedong. Uh, there was a time when you discussed uh, a new era after Mao, but she is saying that no, the first era was a precondition for the current era, and we should never not be, uh, demolish it in any way. <clears throat> uh, so we, we are seeing a, a system that is uh, uh, where, where the leadership determined to 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 maintain it uh, in in the. 2019, the party was celebrating its 70th anniversary, a very well staged event. Uh, in his, his major speech, uh, Xi Jinping spoke about the fact, again, that China had stood up exactly what Mao was saying. And he talks about China's uh, uh, rebirth, the, uh, uh, and it's all thanks to the party. The party providing leadership and, and, uh, and, and, and creating a China that the world 
uh, will respect like never before. Uh, we know that uh, the, the, um, uh, during the, the, the big leap forward, some 40 million people died in China. That is not uh, part of, of official history today at all, which is owned by the party. So, but the big leap that has been taken now, that is of course very much a, a part of, of history. And nationalism has become a very major theme and a glue, you may say. And the party is not only talking about history since day one, 1949, but 4,000 years of history where the, the, the party is, is, is the, the natural custodian and bringing it forward. Uh, one major uh, part of, of the 2019 uh, celebration, of course, 70th year celebration was, of course, to, to show the, the armed forces and the new weapon system. No one should be able to stop China's advance. There would, would be a defense of world class and ready, ready to fight. The defense expenditures are still roughly one third of, of US expenditure. It's hard to compare because you don't have salaries and pensions and so forth. It's a large part of uh, in the US uh, defense budget, 40% or so. Uh, but it's uh, roughly 300 billion today. If you include, if you look at the CP figures, a little bit less. And it, hence it's also more than three times the, the, the Russian defense budget. But well, with striking development, even in China's history, is the, that, the, that the number of, that the fleet uh, is so huge and, and, and the, its reach is so huge. What is striking also that China, also very much thanks to technology, had become what you call a control, control ocracy, a very comprehensive system based on artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, this developed, this is now highly developed in China and, and also exported. And this uh, police standing in a street in, in uh, Beijing is not only uh, uh, controlling traffic generally, she, her spectacles, she, if she focuses on you, uh, she, she, she can, there will be facial recognition. You will be identified and all the, a lot of information of you will immediately be available. So this is a significant dimension of, of course, enhancing. Many people thought, and I thought 20 years ago, that the World Wide Web would be a very huge challenge for the system through its openness and so forth. Now we see it's become a, instead a very major instrument of, of control. And, and uh, what China is talking about is internet sovereignty. Google, Gmail, so forth, are blocked. As I mentioned, this technology is also exported. One dimension which is not so well researched, at least in, from my point of view yet, is what you call a social credit system. People are rated. You're giving, you are giving a certain number, and, and then if you, uh, if you uh, uh, diso uh, misbehave, you are, you're punished. Uh, and, and, and if you do very well, you can be rewarded. And if you, for example, uh, you can suddenly lose the right to, to, to fly or to, to get the law or whatever. And of course, if you are active in the wrong way politically, the punishment may become severe. The system is not fully developed yet, but it's under development and it's fully developed in certain parts of China. <clears throat> Again, China's rise is clearly the biggest uh, change that we are witnessing. And you can clearly talk about a power shift. The US hegemon uh, cannot rule the way it uh, has been used to. Uh, and, and China is determined uh, to, to pursue its, its uh, it's uh, climb, so to speak, to the ability possible. 
this is, who is this? This is Thucydides. Uh, and I'm referring to a book by Graham Allison published in 2017 called Destined for War. Can America and China escape Thucydides trap? Is it possible for these two countries, given the ongoing power, power shift, to avoid war? Thucydides was the first person who addressed these questions scholarly, 400 years before Christ, and when, when, uh, when uh, Sparta was challenged by Athens. And he's saying that such challenges create a distrust and war. Uh, Allison he has looked at the uh, history during the last 500 years, identifying such power shifts, and they have found 16 of them, 12 led to war. Uh, and Allison is saying that for the US and China to be able to cope, uh, since they are on collision course, he says, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's to, will be very demanding. And to preserve status quo uh, is what he, he says impossible. And I, I, I would agree. The, sh the shift is a reality. Luckily, there is no, has been no such war uh, in the nuclear age, as we know, the Cuba crisis is the most serious incident. But the question is there. You can, the, many people have uh, criticized Allison's for its analysis and each and every case can be discussed. Uh, but you cannot uh, deny that the current uh, shift is uh, significant and it's causing uh, a deep strategic distrust. Some people then are saying that we are witnessing a new Cold War. And some people, I see articles all the time, to say it's already a fact, we are in a new Cold War. I think that is a rather hasty uh, uh, conclusion because uh, there are so significant differences also. I, I very much respect Arne Vestad, now at Yale University. He wrote a book in 2017 called The Cold War, A World History. And he has written many articles since then on this question. And he thinks that the, the parallels are uh, rather to, 20, to, to 1914, China, uh, Germany's rise and, uh, and, uh, and the, the superpower rivalry and so forth, and all the distrust that that caused. Mm. I, th I think that is a very interesting question to discuss. There are so many different anyhow. anyhow. Of course, uh, China has no alliance system. There is no warship pact equivalent. Uh, the, the Soviet Union was a, was a major power, nuclear power, but a, a very tiny economy, no world trade dimension. Uh, while China is soon the global biggest economy in the world and also deeply integrated, also the biggest trading nation in the world in goods. Um, so the, 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 the kind of uh, asymmetric situation that prevailed uh, uh, then is, is not the case now. Um, and this integration, of course, we, that is not a single company, Swedish company, of importance not present in, in, in China, as you know. Uh, and um, the value chains are, are, are there uh, and built up so that everything has been based on the idea of, of uh, just in time delivery components coming from all over the world. Suddenly you have a car, you have something else. But of course, such uh, interdependence can also, can also uh, 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 change the course and you may say decoupling as we now witness. Well, certainly I think that China's rise is a bigger challenge than the Soviet Union in many ways. But of course, the biggest challenge of them all is climate change. Then the question, of course, is to what extent is, is, uh, is China an ideological challenge globally, like the, like the Soviet Union? I think there's such a dimension, certainly. China is not a promoter of human rights or democracy, quite the contrary. Uh, and some scholars like Andrew Nathan, one of the more quoted ones, he is saying that one in the conversation one should focus on, 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 on this human rights dimension. Uh, but I think that's again, uh, uh, to now form a new alliance as Biden is talking, a new alliance of democracies and summit for democracies, uh, it's also, also again uh, has its um, 
complications, uh, especially since there are so many reasons for the democracies like the US one to look in, uh, on itself and its own weaknesses and what it, what it required to reemerge stronger. <clears throat> the fact is at least that um, the US can no longer claim to be a system manager. And we see something that is changing over time. Countries are hedging, uh, not least countries in the in the neighborhood in in, in Asia. Uh, so you need a framework, and I hope that the Biden administration, as I mentioned, will be able to develop a more predictable way of of interacting with with uh, with with, uh, with China. What Joseph Nye called uh, managed rivalry during Trump, that was an impossibility. And if we turn for a minute to, uh, to the meeting two weeks ago in Alaska, um, it was uh, striking that uh, the opening statements were so tough, even the, by Blinken, there was no invitation to, uh, to cooperation, but just the stating of facts, a, a, a blunt uh, way of criticizing uh, China for, for uh, for all its violations, for its uh, international behavior, for not st sticking to international norms and so forth, for being a threat. And, and, and uh, the Jenny uh, Yang Xinxia, member of the Politburo down to the right, he, he uh, responded in a very tough language. It's, and this short opening session of the meeting publicly went on for more than hours, as you have seen probably. So it was a kind of positioning, positioning. Uh, and uh, they stressed very much on the American side that they were coming from Tokyo and Seoul. They had been meeting with their close allies before they met with China. Biden had a virtual meeting before this meeting with the Quad leaders, Japan, India, Australia, and so forth. Uh, but there was this uh, distinction at least between conflict, comp competition, and, and, uh, and, and uh, cooperation. And uh, you may have noticed that Yellen, the, the uh, American uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, she spoke the other day. She said, our economic relation with China, like our broad relationship with China, will be competitive where it should be, collaborative where it can be, and adver adversarial where it must be. I think that is uh, the way it is. And hopefully the two sides can cope and understand and thereby reducing risks, especially risk for misunderstandings leading to something more serious. After the um, Alaska meeting, uh, Blinken uh, addressed the NATO meeting, NATO meeting, calling for Western unity in deterring China's military aggression and Russian aggression, as I mentioned before. And Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, he uh, went to Beijing and you can see that they are pushed closer to each other. They, 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 uh, which is uh, interesting itself. <clears throat> so once again, according to Gideon Oman, uh, one of a leading commentator of Financial Times, he's saying, once again, you have a Russia-China axis, a raid against the Western alliance led from Washington. Uh, and of course, that's, uh, they, they such a tendency, even though, as you know, China and, and uh, and Soviet Union fought the war, border war in 69. You must also remember that, again, this is a very asymmetric relationship. The size of the Russian economy is the same as the size of the economy of Guangdong, Guangdong province, one the, the most, the largest province in China. So, and China is not too, too impressed by, by, by uh, Russia in so many ways. A comforting fact is what is coined the East Asian peace. After the Second World War, of those who died in combat in the world, 80% died in East Asia, Korean War, Vietnam War. But China has not uh, entered into a, a war since it punished Vietnam in 
February of 79, after Vietnam had moved into Cambodia. Mm. That there were the, the relationship remained very bad, and there were tensions and confrontations for another 10 years between Vietnam and China. So that is a, you can sometimes talk about the uh, uh, Chinese military as generals, as desk generals. They are building us this enormous uh, armed forces, but and they are restless, that's for sure. Of course, we have seen many wars in the, in the world in the meantime, in the Middle East, but that have been American wars. So there's, we have been talking about an economic Asia, an, an Asia growing, becoming the most uh, important growth region in the world for so many years, rather than a security Asia. But this peace that has then prevailed has not become institutionalized. It's rather more fragile. And of course, now as tensions are growing, we can see again a return to more security Asia, growing tensions. When it comes to the South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, of course, for its reasons, the Taiwan question. An interesting fact here is that the, the, um, the US defense line, its forward defense line, goes from South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and downwards. Of course, very close to, to China's coast. And of course, the Chinese they would say that let's, let's divide the, 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 Xi Jinping has said, the, the, the Pacific Ocean is big enough for both of us. <laughs> but uh, the, Chinese, the American position here with these allies are very close uh, to, to, to China. Uh, and um, well, we see what's happening here. This is uh, the South China Sea, the Spratly Islands, where China is claiming they, ha they have a nine dash line uh, identifying the whole area as, uh, by history. Chinese, and uh, what what is one day uh, 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 a, a a reef is next day something bigger, and suddenly you have an airstrip. Suddenly you have further installations. This is happening. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's happening uh, like in a salami kind of way, which you take two photos with a you know interval of a year. You will see it very vividly. And of course, there are American carriers. Uh, war plane, war uh, in, in the in the area all the time. So there is there is friction, growing friction, and go, growing distrust, and that could certainly be, be incidents. <clears throat> Another dimension, of course, is Hong Kong, known for for being uh, not a full-fledged democracy, but a, a, a country and a culture where freedom has been prevailing very much, freedom of thought, freedom of association, and so forth. Now we. Uh, and the agreement in 1997 was based on one China, two systems. And now we are seeing more and more of one China, one system. And again, the election laws and so forth are changed to loyalty is the criteria. And you can, you can go on. Uh, you can look at Xinjiang, which is, of course, a, a growing issue of international concern. You may talk, I think, of a, of a culture uh, genocide given the, 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 what's happening to the Uyghur Muslim population. And not least, Taiwan. That is the most critical security issue, I think. Uh, one of the most serious in the world, and certainly most serious in the region. As you know, it's based on, on, a, on a, a US commitment. Uh, to, de to defend Taiwan. But the US has also been keen to man maintain a certain ambivalence, ambiguity, not to encourage uh, Taiwanese uh, ideas about uh, independence. They were very obvious in 20 to 2005, like that, less so today. Uh, so uh, start status quo has been prevailing and uh, shifting, but still prevailing. Um, what when um, China moved uh, the way they did on Hong Kong, uh, that uh, had uh, major effects on Taiwan. And, uh, and uh, in, the, in the election last uh, January, last year, uh, 2020, uh, uh, the president uh, was re-elected uh, very much as, uh, as a consequence, I think, of, 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 of uh, 
of China's acting. Uh, so we are seeing here a many people are you can see in today's paper even about uh, the U.S. changing its position because there will be less of of ambiguity, making its commitment more clear. But over time, it's very complex. You can imagine. Uh, <clears throat> if we go closer to home, uh, we have uh, cause green high. I think you may say it's an example of sharp power. This Swedish citizen, he was kidnapped in the third country in Thailand and now sentenced to 10 years in jail. I cannot go into that more deeply, but uh, certainly it's, it's not based on law. <clears throat> you know, and China is also even proudly talking about wolf warrior diplomacy. The, the, this, the, 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 uh, the strong power is, is using its muscles. <clears throat> so it's a more uh, assertive, and more nationalistic China. And this has deep roots. You must not forget how China interprets its own history. These are kids in school, and what are they told? They are told never to forget national humiliation. And that is what they call 100 years of humiliation ever since Hong Kong, uh, ever since uh, the Opium War and, and Hong Kong also. Um, and I think it's very much maintained that notion today. And of course, this, this is part of the background. Uh, it is a cartoon from the, the late 1890s, where you can see the, the Chinese is powerless, watching uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and Queen Victoria and so forth. Uh, the Tsar and Marianne is in the background, the Japanese are there to, to divide China among themselves. Now, the answer is you need a strong, you, you see, this must never happen. You need a strong China. And this is emphasized again and again. And the party is, of course, delivering that, that strength that is a fundamental message. <clears throat> so this is the kind of drama we are witnessing. But it's, again, it's not, uh, it's not uh, 1991, the collapse of union, what not, the end of history. Nor is this the end of history. Uh, and also, I think the, the uh, Chinese party state, the way I have described it, is, uh, is entrenched, but not the, and again, not the end of history. Uh, but of course, we see many warring developments. And I would advise you to have a look at the latest report from Freedom House uh, on, on uh, freedom in the world. They talk about, uh, they have recorded 15 years of, of decline when it comes to political civil liberties in the world. 15 consecutive years since 2005. The global score, uh, there'll be more uh, negative than positive changes each and every year, <clears throat> and certainly uh, uh, last year. It may also say that the West is lacking its ability to live up to its own values, to renew itself, when it comes to investment, competitiveness, education, innovation, social inclusiveness, commitments to major global issues like climate change. And of course, the EU has to find its role in, in all this. Also, the EU has uh, declared uh, China to be a systemic rival. Uh, and now, of course, the transatlantic relationship is revitalized under, uh, as, as Biden uh, is when after he became president, but again, the EU must define its role beyond what, what is defined by the transatlantic relationship. But in a sense, you may say that the world is adrift, that serves China, that also scope for cooperation. And I hope, as I mentioned before, that the um, Glasgow meeting in November on climate will be very significant. And, and you need such successes, you need examples where cooperation is necessary. And then you can build on that uh, when it comes to cooperation on other issues, for example, on pandemics, on, on there are so many issues, infinite number of issues, and regional challenges like the question of Iran and its nuclear weapons, the North Korea, and there is a, an, an agenda of, 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 of major challenges which ought to be addressed. Uh, but that remains to be seen. So I thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, 
Dr. Jungian, for a very interesting presentation. Um, I would now like to remind the audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A function below. And I can see that we already have a few questions, so I will start with reading one of those. Um, and the first question is from Eliana Dalia, uh, who asks, uh, what role did China's involvement in the Korean War play in shaping the role of the CCP in Chinese society? Please, Dr. Yunjia. Could you repeat the question? I, 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 guess, I think I got it, but could you repeat it for sure, but to make yes. sure? What role did China's involvement in the Korean War play in shaping the role of the CCP in Chinese society? Well, of course, if you go back uh, the way you need to do uh, to 1949-50, uh, uh, in shortly after the, the Chinese Revolution, um, North Korea, uh, uh, supported uh, by, by Stalin and, and also endorsed by China, uh, crossed into South, South Korea. That was also possible because there was no, no clear commitment uh, at that time to, 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 to defend South Korea. But that development had very major consequences, including as regards Taiwan. Of course, the US became then more and more committed to defend um, both uh, South Korea. And, uh, and of course, there was a major, there was a war uh, 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 between the US, of course, under a UN umbrella in China ending in 1953 with a ceasefire along the old ceasefire, ceasefire line. And, and since then it has been unresolved in spite of so many efforts. And um, there have been uh, very serious efforts like under the Clinton administration, very close to something interesting happening. But uh, then we got a change in 2000, 2001, uh, Bush Jr. He talked about the axis of evil. He was not interested in pursuing uh, the, the Clinton uh, uh, policy, and then we suddenly it became more and more clear 2002 that uh, North Korea developed nuclear weapons. And that, of course, put a full stop in a sense to, uh, to uh, that development. China stepped in then, uh, invited the six party talks, and China's commitment to uh, China is not happy about development in, in North Korea. China would like to see uh, North Korea undertake economic reforms uh, along their own lines, uh, but that has not happened. But again, they are they would never uh, allow a, a Korean Peninsula uh, uh, becoming a, a, a US ally. So uh, it, it's a very, very deep dilemma. Uh, right now, North Korea is going through very difficult times also because of the pandemic and ex extreme isolation. I think the people are is suffering enormously, but the uh, uh, people suffering is not the main concern of, uh, of its great leader. Thank you. We have another question um, from Julia Forsberg, who asks, what's your view on the development of the Russian-Sino relations since 2014? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I touched upon it. It's a very important question. Uh, and I mentioned the, 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 how bad relationships were and, the, and the, the even the, the, the war along the Yalu River in 69. Um, and, uh, for many years, the common notion was that this was a marriage of convenience, not a love affair. And of course, uh, particularly from the Chinese point of view, the West was so much more important when it comes to economy, technology. What China had to offer uh, was really uh, oil and gas. And of course, there are major, major pipelines and so forth. Uh, but over time now, you can see that um, uh, these two leaders are, are, are that there have been joint exercises and so forth, and they are getting closer, push close, you may say. Uh, and, and I think that uh, I think it, it's also a Western dilemma uh, what can be done uh, to avoid uh, a, a deepening of, of that alliances uh, militarily and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's a worrisome development. Um, and I think it's uh, bound to, uh, to continue now. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Julian Tucker, who writes, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Ambassador Yingyuan. You mentioned the importance of loyalty for the contemporary party leadership, and that Xi has become the most powerful leader since Mao. Some have, even, some have 
is seen the recent celebration of Hua Guofeng's career as indicating a shift away from Deng Xiaoping's approach to governance. Could you elaborate a little bit on this point? Is it part of the party state's long-term trajectory, or is it uh, symptomatic of political op opportunism in the run-up for the CCP yeah. 110th anniversary yeah. celebration? True, but this is the 100th anniversary. Uh, it's, it's a very major one uh, coming up now in this summer. Uh, uh, one of my close friends, Tony Sage, one of the best scholars in the world on China, is publishing a book on, on, on those hundred years. I think highly recommendable for sure. Um, the the uh, uh, over time uh, the the the, the, na the nature. If you look back at um, the Deng Xiaoping era, he he wanted to. Uh, separate the party from government not totally but he wanted to say that the party has its role government is, has its role and uh, he talked about institution building but also more transparent within the party state for sure that's very important to remember and that was certainly the case when i worked in uh, worked in china and with uh, a leader like uh, huin tao uh, and uh, the current prime minister, if he had become the party leader, he, he has a law degree, a uh, doctoral degree in law and is interested in constitutional questions. But uh, what, is, what we have seen now is a situation where the party, in, in, in the logic of the party state, is very much back into everything. It's a symbiotic kind of system with, of course, uh, the party being the stronger part of the symbiosis. And it's also true when it comes to uh, to uh, corporations. Uh, Jack Ma, you saw what happened to him recently, uh, Alibaba, the, the most successful entrepreneur in China, that he, he became a little bit too cocky and uh, so forth, and then he was cut down to size. Of course, many of these people are members of the party. It's better to be in the tent, so to speak, as I think. Uh, and so, and, and uh, Xi Jinping is, you can, is strikingly uh, concerned about uh, loyalty. Uh, and uh, of course, there are but many people in China, intellectuals, who are really critical of all this, who who like to see much more, uh, more reform-minded uh, kind of leadership of the Communist Party. But uh, their role, their, the space for them today, is is uh, indeed uh, limited. I must say. And um, I recall I met a couple of years ago in Uppsala a, a very well-known. Uh, Chinese academic, a scientist, um, and uh, he, he published a book ten plus years ago. Uh, it, it, it was book, it was published, but he was uh, uh, working at CAS, the academy in China. The title of the book was "Democracy is a Good Thing," and I asked him, "Could you imagine such a book today being published?" No, impossible. Uh, so the the, the the intellectuals are uh, are. Um, um, they have this, this, the room, the space they have to maneuver, to express themselves, to organize themselves, it, it has certainly been shrinking. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Milena Vranjes, who asks, what are your thoughts on the current policies towards the Uyghur minority? Also recently in Inner Mongo Mongolia, the Mongolian language is not uh, to be used in schools. Again, of course, the the, the Uyghur question is, is is very serious and very tragic. Um, the if you look at the ethnic composition of, of China as a whole, some 94 percent are, are Han Chinese. So the, the the percentage of the total of the minorities are yeah, less than five, less than seven percent. And of course, there are more than 50, and I recognize formally in the constitution, and there are certain autonomous regions and so forth. And I have been to a number of such regions, also along the, the Vietnamese Lao border and so forth. Um, and they are often quite uh, less developed uh, and they have no aspirations. But, but there are, you have Tibet uh, and, and you have Xinjiang, uh, and of course, you also uh, the uh, Inland Mongolia, the, the, the two. Uh, Critical ones are, of course, Tibet. Uh, we know that whole history, history of Dalai Lama and so forth very well. And it's an interesting question coming up because he will ultimately die uh, and what should happen then, of course. But now we, we talk about the Uyghur uh, and Xinjiang. Uh, it, this is also linked very much to the, the development in Central Asia and beyond of, of uh, IS and te uh, terrorism. 
um, and of course there have been some some Uyghurs who have been participating abroad in, in such activities, but the the, the uh, repression is is very striking, and the the uh, the the, um, the the uh, it's clear that uh, that uh, the the, uh, the culture of the Uyghurs is, is uh, under under siege. You have also Muslims in China, which are uh, been there for you can go to Beijing, there are mosques dating back uh, almost a thousand years, uh, and they have not been particularly threatened. Now, there are members from Beijing, there are so many uh, also Muslim restaurants serving Muslim food and so forth, but they are also now f feeling the, the heat because of what's happening in. in um, uh, some people have seen uh, think that Beijing will yield somehow and, uh, and uh, open up uh, after a certain period. Uh, but I think that they, the, the, uh, the, the, the general mood in China today is, is very nationalistic, chauvinistic, Han Chinese. And I don't think um, Chinese people in general are very concerned about this. And when, when the word now is criticized in China so heavily and, and, uh, and um, also um, um, putting sanctions on China. I think that rather strengthening better. I've not been back to China now for, because of the pandemic for so long, but um, what I read and discuss, um, as China is criticized, whatever it is, uh, uh, China responds, reaction is often that it's unfair and, and uh, they hit back uh, very strongly, as was example at, at this Alaska meeting. I think it's also true of this issue. Uh, Hopefully I'm wrong, but I'm afraid that uh, this uh, rather repressive, also, as you said, language. Uh, you, you, are, you, you are as a minority, if, if you look at the, what happened now in March in Beijing, you have all the minority showing up in their national addresses, but that, yes, that's yes for show. The reality is that especially those, if you challenge a system like the Uyghurs do, uh, then, then uh, your culture is, is is reduced and reduced the space for expressing yourself when it comes to the traditions, habits, religious practices. It's strictly <clears throat> said. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Erik Teres Aranda, uh, who asks, how is the relationship between the current CCP leadership and the legacy of Maoism, for example, when it comes to uh, when it comes with the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution and its implication for the stability of yeah. the country? Yeah. Again, very good questions. Um, I, when it became clear that uh, Xi Jinping would become the next leader in China, uh, I, uh, I, I, when I actually, when I still worked there, I, I went to uh, call on, on, on Xi Jinping uh, when he was state, when he was party secretary in, in, in Xi'an province. Uh, and uh, uh, he was not then the only candidate, but he emerged rather soon as the key candidate. Also, he was shifted to become, became hot secretary in Shanghai. That was a very significant development. Uh, many people said that he would, he would probably be a reformist. He had been interested in uh, promoting entrepreneurs and so forth in Xi'an province, which is known for entrepreneurs. And he's also said that, look, uh, his father, was a prominent uh, leader in the party, the revolutionary. He suffered enormously because in 1962, uh, Xi's father uh, was accused of, of, uh, of um, plotting against Mao. There was a book published which was supposed to be critical of Mao. Uh, it was not, he was not correct, but that, that was the acquisition. Uh, uh, and you may then think that Xi would not love Mao exactly. But actually, she was she saying that Mao saved my father's life. But because the then very famous uh, security chief, he, he wanted to execute uh, she's, she's father. So, uh, and there was, as I mentioned before, this uh, idea for a long time that you had the Mao era, and then you had a new, better one opening up, Deng Xiaoping, which, uh, uh, and, and the, 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 uh, the big leap forward and also the cultural revolution were, were, were shocking experiences. But, uh, and actually um, Xi Jinping himself was affected. He was sent out youth to live for, for a number of years in a rural area where, where he made a certain career within the party. 
very dedicated young man. Uh, so um, that was the idea that that uh, uh, the, the, that we will see a, a a she that would, would be representing reformist ideas. But no, uh, also of course, when he was elected in 2012, the party secretary, the party was in quite a crisis situation. Corruption was widespread. Warshilai was a challenger. So his recipe became re-establish re the party, fight corruption. Many people say that he will fight corruption for one year, the first Lunar New Year, but he's done it ever since 2012, when he's continued to do so. So he has, created a, a party which is more based on loyalty uh, uh, and, uh, as I said, put the party on top of, of the of government in a way. With, and also the military, the loyalty of the military crucial uh, uh, and, and the space for civil, uh, civil organizations less. So it's, um, uh, then there are cracks, of course, and there are many people who are not happy with uh, this development in all respects. But uh, uh, Xi Jinping has also, has also they, have, they have removed, he can be re-elected re for a third, third time and, and beyond that even. Uh, though those constraints have been removed, constitutional, institutional uh, constraints have been removed. Um, so he's, um, this, I, I, I'm hoping that all this is uh, yielding, generating uh, concern and reactions. And there are so many people ask, victims of, of this, so forth. But for the time being, and for quite some time, uh, and also the, given the, how democracies in the West have developed. I think in China, they look at now at what Trump and the siege of Capitol Hill on the 6th, 6th of January. This is not what we want, they say, and, and so forth. So it's, uh, again, um, long, uh, long uh, uh, answer to a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Miliana Ranez, uh, who writes, thank you for a very interesting talk. What uh, is the relation with the neighbor Mongolia in view of the banning of Mongolian language in Chinese Inner Mongolia? Well, <clears throat> um, Mongolia, of course, is uh, as a country. I, I was ambassador also to Mongolia, but not but just visiting. Um, from Beijing, um, of course, uh, they have close ties to to, uh, to Soviet Union and Russia traditionally, and they are concerned about uh, China's uh, big role. Uh, but and, and they, but they're very dependent, also as a landlocked country, very dependent of, of China on Chinese investment and Chinese interest in natural resources, is which, which is um, every country surrounding. Uh, China is by China seen as a potential source of what they need, national resources and so forth, certainly Mongolia. Um, I have not, I'm sure that they are very concerned in Mongolia, but I, they would not protest. And if I may use a parallel, um, if you go back in, in there were rather, there were riots um, in the capital of, of Xinjiang, the, the Uyghur question, um, in 2009 or so, and Erdogan, he said, these are our brothers, our Muslim brothers. Recently has said nothing. And all these uh, Muslim countries surrounding China, they are too dependent on China. And they are very concerned for sure. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm sure that the Mongolians, uh, they are also uh, managing their situation carefully. I think that all the neighbors are what they are doing what you call hedging. And of course, in Mongolia was also building closer ties to, to uh, they, Mongolia talks about the virtual neighbors. They're like the US or Japan or other countries to strengthen their situation. Thank you. We have another question from Bengt Lindberg, who asks, the Soviet system and the rest of the countries beyond the Iron Curtain was overthrown by the people. What is the explanation to that the leaders in China have su survived in power for over 70 years? Yes, yes, they have for, for sure. And I think that um, um, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, they analyzed that situation very carefully. There was this idea that also China would collapse and all the other five 
uh, communist, remain in communist countries because that was the idea at the time. Uh, but it didn't happen. Instead, we have seen China growing by 10% a year until, until recently. Uh, and what, of course, what China, what China, what China did, so many things differently, uh, um, and, and uh, invested heavily uh, in, in uh, developing a, a market economy and getting linked into the global economy. As I said, China today is the biggest trading nation in the world. The Soviet Union was, had, had no trade worth mentioning. Uh, so it's a completely different model and it has managed, it has worked. It has worked, it has delivered uh, economic growth and also well-being. As I mentioned, 850 people less living uh, below the poverty line uh, is, is quite a striking phenomenon. And in all respects, uh, China has developed uh, uh, within the, all the constraints of what state developed, some of the number of people going through higher education and all this, the life expectancy, whatever, there are, there are results which are uh, undeniable. So, um, but I also mentioned how Xi Jinping, he felt his 70 years itch that he was worried all the time. And uh, people say that he's not sleeping very well, uh, that can, he's feeling under threat and so forth. Um, uh, because he knows, of course, uh, maybe somewhere, inside himself that, that a system not based on free and fair elections is not legitimate. But I think that he can, he can easily convince himself that it is. And his history, the mission of the Communist Party, Chinese culture, and so forth. The, the rhetoric is impressive. Thank you. Next question is from Maria Pietersson who asks, can you elaborate a bit more about the factors which will shape the relationship between the US and China in the near future? Well, yes, I, first of all, uh, if, you, if, if you, maybe because of my age, I, I love to re make references in time, but there was a time, if you go back 30 years, when Japan was uh, the, the sort of country that was emerging there was a book for some for Esther Vogel called Japan is number one. And Washington couldn't tolerate it. And there were even Japanese interests buying up uh, assets in New York, uh, in a way, uh, I think, uh, uh, in, in a shocking way, and, and uh, movie co uh, corporations and so forth. Uh, that was in passing. China. Uh, uh, Japan went into stagnation and so forth, and nobody would today think of, of, of um, Japan in such terms. But I think China's emergence is, is real <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and it's uh, ongoing. And it, uh, you may say that given the nature of the system, uh, if you look at in conventional economics, it, it should, they should fail somehow. Uh, because I don't have uh, these issues in place that you expect, but they are not, and you must then uh, make a choice between uh, preaching your own values or looking at realities. And I think reality is quite telling. China is China is coping. So that is a fundamental fact that you have a, a hegemon, the U.S., increasingly challenged by a, a country which is also having a completely different political system. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, this is um, it, it can, it can, it, this is not uh, going to go away. This uh, distrust, strategic distrust, is a reality. And you can see now in Washington, they, they justify the, the defense budget is already 730 billion US dollars. Now they will increase it further with reference to China and so forth. Um, so that is, they, they touch a dimension. But as I mentioned, technology, I think, because the, one, maybe, one of the most amazing things about China, if you take the basic idea, standard conventional idea, that an authoritarian state cannot be uh, producing innovations, real innovations. But China does. China is uh, now, all the world companies are there investing, sometimes meeting like H&M now, big challenges, but, um, so you, you will see new technologies developing in China and, and, and artificial intelligence is, is some people, it's, it's like the oil yesterday, now it's, it's the quantity of data and so on that, it, that um, AI is based on. Um, so it's a, 
very long-term challenge. So the only possibility is for these countries and for the rest of the world is that they should be able to find ways of, of coping, coexisting, uh, manage, managing confrontation. Uh, um, and and, uh, and, as a, and uh, maybe that's a good way of concluding because I'm very much very concerned about climate change. And I think we are not, we are, we have not at all reacted the world the way we ought to. Uh, this is, we should have reacted less when, as when it comes to the pandemic, it has to be addressed. Time is running out. But I hope that uh, the Glass Committee will be, you know, it's actually Biden has now invited some 40 countries to a climate meeting before then. And uh, of course, Xi Jinping is invited, Putin is also invited, all the major emitters are invited. So I'm, I hope and actually I believe that the Glass Committee will uh, be a significant. Uh, uh, example of that cooperation uh, uh, is still possible in, uh, and that uh, you, you are, we are able to see that because this is an existential question for mankind. Uh, so that might be a good, I don't know whether further question, but that's, uh, let's be optimistic in that sense. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time, but I think we can take two more questions and then we will wrap up. Um, so the next question is from David Bayon, who asks, why didn't Western leaders take a more critical stand against China at the Davos Forum, given China's question, questionable behavior in the COVID crisis? And why are so few mm -hmm. leaders condemning China's complete disregard towards its international responsibilities? Yeah, well, uh, of course, they are all very much uh, in China. They are all... Where, 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 where do companies today make their profit? Often in China. Where is the future markets in China? And so forth. That's a very key part of the explanation. But also, I think, to be fair, uh, it's absolutely sure that the, 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 uh, the um, origin of, of COVID-19 is in, in, in China, in Wuhan. Not in a laboratory, I think, but uh, this animal market that we have seen. I worked in China in 2003 when, when, when we experienced uh, SARS. It, it never became so serious, but uh, then it took months for, for China before they even, uh, they, they denied it completely for four or five months, I recall vividly, um, because there are so many uh, events happening and they didn't want to, to have them disturb. This time, uh, we know that uh, you, you can go back to November 2019. Uh, there were signs, and you, men, you have this famous young doctor, Dr. Lee. He wrote um, uh, to his colleagues that he this was a, an exceptional, strange kind of virus. And then he was contacted by the police, and he was forced to sign a document, never to not to spread false rumors. But he became a hero. Unfortunately, he died from from COVID in February of last year. Uh, but uh, the Chinese tried to cover up, but they also informed the WTO already in the beginning of, of last year, January last year. And they also in, in, informed CDC, their counterpart in Washington, that there was something strange. Uh, you cannot say it was a 100% cover, but then of course, uh, um, after three or four weeks, they launched this enormous campaign, and after 77 days, whatever, they had had it under control in in uh, in, in, in in that province, in the Wuhan. Uh, so and you cannot you can never trust figures when it comes to China, but uh, they say that less than that only four thousand people have died from COVID. Much less one third of what died were died in the number in Sweden, which is uh, not credible. But the number is very small, very small, uh, because they focused in in a very authoritarian way, you may say, on, on uh, testing, tracing and testing, tracing, testing. Uh, there are also other countries in the region. Taiwan has succeeded equally well, South Korea very well, Vietnam very well, so forth. And they all learn from SARS. Um, uh, but of course, this is, um, you, you, you may, you, you, now the, the, uh, there have been this WHO mission there, and there it's after one year, and it's not very conclusive. And it, it already questioned, it criticized. <clears throat> and and uh, one thing is for sure, China will never tell the full truth. That is in the nature of the system. And also after one year, and, and um, the, the centralization also of the system makes it unlikely that local people dare to 
to tell when they should have told. They wait for a sign from the top be, be, before before they re recognized. Uh, and it was, I can tell you, if it may be fascinating, um, it was quite clear in the beginning of 2003 that SARS was, was emerging, WHO and so said so. But it took a long time, China has denied it. But then there was a retired medical doctor in Beijing. He said in an interview with Time magazine, yet before Easter of that year, 2003, I'm so surprised they say that there are only 30 cases in all of Beijing, but there are more than 30 cases in the hospital where I take my tea every day as a retired doctor. And then the, the China changed its mind completely and, and, and launched an enormous campaign against the SARS. It took a couple of months before that. But of course, this is much more serious. This is a, a, a pandemic which now has, you have already, um, uh, almost three million people have died and so forth. Uh, but um, the, the, um, the, 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 if you take business, you, that was David, 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 why didn't, that was the question. Um, I think the business uh, people, they are, they are trying to, to maneuver, strike a balance. They want to preserve their economic interests. They, they don't want to take the main responsibility for criticizing China. HM is a very, it's a very delicate position. Uh, that would remain the case. Uh, you have to you have to expect political leaders to, to articulate questions and business will adjust accordingly i think <clears throat> thank you um our last question is from eliana dalim who asks what role does the party play in people's everyday lives today is it for example possible to advance in one's career without being a party member I'm surprised that you have more questions, even though I, my answers are much too long, but uh, this kind of improvised essays. Um, well, the party is a, uh, based on the idea of democratic centralism, Leninist party. It has 90 million members, 90 million, nine zero. And you have 1.4 billion inhabitants. So it's a, an elitist party, vanguard party. That is the idea. And uh, you cannot just uh, say, hi, hi, I want to become a member of the party and then sign up like you would do in Sweden. You want to join one of the parties. Or you could launch a new party in Sweden even. Uh, in, in China, it, there's, a, there's a, uh, a vetting process before you are admitted. And, and you have to swear an oath. And when you have become admitted, you, you, can, you must not only obey Chinese laws, but also party laws. Uh, and they may uh, decide to, to promote you in this way or that way, or they may decide the opposite. But many people join because I think it has advantages. Uh, today, the, the, uh, the party is trying very much to recruit young, gifted people at universities and so forth, at an early age, and also in, before then, but they want, they want talent in all walks of life. Uh, and many people think, well, also maybe the family, well, uh, if they ask you, do join. I mean, not joining could, could cause you trouble. And if you have joined to withdraw, I know many people who are members, but they don't, they're not active, uh, but they still sign that yeah, I'm, I'm withdrawing as a price. Uh, and all, the, all based on loyalty and monitoring of our members. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, it, it had not become a more open party over time. If you uh, <clears throat> if you have a party congress, it's uh, as there will be next year. It's, it's a rather stage process again. Uh, but you cannot deny that uh, uh, that the system, uh, in spite of all its faults and uh, and uh, disturbing elements, uh, is capable in a sense because you also have today a a bureaucracy uh, within the system that is, uh, if you take the central bank, the people who are in charge of the central bank in China, they are very competent. I remember once I had a visit to, when I worked in China by Swedish politician, he wanted to look at the, discuss the pension systems. He, he was the chairperson of the Swedish reform of the pension system. And when he met his uh, Chinese counterparts, he thought that they would ask a question, but they knew exactly 
everything that they need to know about every system in the world and the plus and minuses of those systems. So you have a you have a cadre of also of uh, of, uh, of competence of call uh, of uh, uh, yes of of. Uh, of very well trained people today, of course, produced in in in, in within their own system, uh, but uh, but loyalty to that system uh, is the key to career. Thank you. Um, so before we end this webinar, do you have any final comments that you would like to add, Dr. Jungian? Oh, only that I enjoyed discussion and questions, and uh, that I had a. a or rather open-ended questions. And as I said, I, I tend to try to react very spontaneously. And I, I'm sure I said some things which are odd, odd, but I also hope that I said a few things which might you think further about the nature of the system. And I think that uh, what I, the way I define and describe the party state is not uh, original, but I think it's, it's uh, rather useful key to the system. And uh, the, the point is that uh, one party state, there are so many of them, they can come and go, but this is a, a, a construct which is much, much bigger. And, and uh, with the ultimate laws of the party uh, have control in the army to stay in power. So uh, you, you have to, I even do so younger of you, you have to expect that uh, the, the, the common part of China will, will not collapse in the, tomorrow. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Jungian, for your presentation and for a very interesting webinar. Uh, also, thank you, Tobian Lodian, head of uh, ISDP's China Center, for joining us. And I was, would also like to thank the audience for joining and for asking good questions. Um, for more information about upcoming events, please visit our website. I wish you all a good day and a nice weekend. Thanks for job. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.